All right, it's Wednesday, and I'm glad that you came back, especially after last Monday's lecture, which now that that's passed, I can tell you that that lecture is the one that I, I actually kind of fear that the most, because I know that's probably about the most complicated one, uh, even though we don't necessarily have any e to the r's or one over sine theta showing up anymore. In that sense, maybe it's a little bit easier. But we also had a integral that was actually like 20 integrals at once. That kind of makes it hard again, doesn't it? Now, one of the things, I, you know, I've said this a zillion times, and it bears repeating, this quantum mechanical stuff, you know, before COVID happened, I still filmed the class, and I still put them up on YouTube, and that was because sometimes, especially after last Monday's lecture, I, I don't, there's just no good way to get that across, except, excuse me, except maybe just to watch it again, and maybe, maybe even again. So that's why I had been filming these things, and I've been doing this for some time, was in case you were just like, wait, what? You know, after there's step after step after step after step, and you forget what you were doing to begin with. And, um, you know, I know this is kind of cheap, but the easiest solution is just perhaps just to watch it again. So, with that said, you can watch Monday's lecture again. I am going to spend quite a bit of time summarizing it with a you know, bit of a bigger picture, which is more likely to be on the test because, you know, I can't really ask, I can't get quite as mathematical on the test given the weirdness of, of all this going on, hopefully ending soon. All right, so I'm going to give a comprehensive lecture, a uh, review of, of what we talked about last time, and maybe if you watch this and you're still confused and you go back and rewatch, then hopefully it'll all make sense. And again, the, 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 the reason I think it's so easy to get lost is that after so many steps, you don't remember what you were trying to do to begin with. And if that's the case, then it's a wash, right? Okay, anyway, so review. Now, what were we doing? So, multi-electron this and that. And the simplest multi-electron thing, you know, you think after we do hydrogen atoms, other atoms are the same thing, just bigger. And unfortunately, not so much, not because of the size of atoms, because they have more than one electron. And as much as you'd think like, well, just you, you just say that there's another electron with another 2s or a 2p state, and as you know, it gets unfortunately way more complicated. And the way I would walk you through all the different layers of complication is to think of, again, the simplest multi-electron thing that exists here or anywhere, or even in the Marvel universe, is a hydrogen anion. And its ground state would have a spin up, spin down in the 1s orbital. And I shine light on it, and I, I take the opportunity to remind you that, of course, it's higher energy because one of the electrons will be in a p state, a 2p state, and maybe it's a pz if you use z-polarized light. And notice it's kind of funky how I've done this. I've just shifted everything upward, and that's kind of not really correct, but I'm not sure how to express, you know, this whole thing is higher in energy, and of course it is. It absorbs light, so it's higher in energy. And you started out spin up, spin down, so you would still retain spin up, spin down. And that's because light does not have the, the type of angular momentum that is spin, which is separate from the type of angular momentum that is S and P, which is very easy to understand. P has an electron whizzing around the nucleus. Now I understand that. That's the kind of angular momentum that light has. So when the photon disappears, you still have to account for that. And so that's why the electron goes into the P state. But it should stay, in this case, it stays spin down. Now for reasons I'll explain, it can, it can flip over. And, and that's also a lower energy state. That's not why it happens. We'll explain why. I'll explain why at the end of the lecture. But it turns out that this state is slightly higher in energy than this state. So, so yeah, it would like to go to a triplet state. And instead of spin up, spin down, spin up, spin up. Okay. So, there's that. <laughs> Since we're still kind of in quantum land, what are the wave functions? And the wave functions are 
Um, we multiply the wave function, you know, once I'm in S state. So, so here, one S state, one S state, and each one has the coordinates of electron one, and the other one has coordinates of electron two. Uh, we permute the labels because we can't necessarily say we know which electron goes in what. Okay, so that's all fine and good. Now we know that if we permute the labels, somewhere we've got to pick up a minus sign, and that's part of the Pauli principle, right? That is the, that's the principle that says an electron cannot be, uh, cannot, two electrons cannot be in the exact same state. And that's okay with this as long as they're spin up and spin down. But that's why we end up having to have spin wave functions. And we don't know what they are other than just alpha, beta. They do have certain properties which your homework is going to get into. I didn't want to spend too much time in class on that. Your homework will explain some of the funny things that these functions do. Um, and it comes, oh, oh my god, I had, did that wrong. It's minus sign. Right, so what happens here is if, if you permute the labels, one and two, every R1 turns to an R2 and all that, then this guy will give you a minus sign. And it needs to be that way or this stuff doesn't work for all the reasons I said in the previous lecture. So I can't, I can't explain everything, right? I can't go back on everything. All right, so this state and this state would use this wave function. Uh, the difference between here and here is that the, instead of here, this is a 1s, 1s, Right, that's e to the minus r, and in um, in here, the second wave function is actually a two p. Let's say it's a two p z state. So again, relatively straightforward. All right. Now, if it goes to a triplet state, here's our wave function. Now, the part that generates a negative sign, if you do this weird permutation of labels, is actually the space part of the wave function, and that's because the spin part is kind of simple. Uh, here I've drawn alpha, alpha, up, up, and so I've also made the spin part alpha, alpha. So you don't have any way of making this part anti-symmetric, so that's why you have to do the space part. Now recall that there also has to be two others. Uh, you could have had beta, beta, that would have been spin, um, you know, spin down, spin down, it's kind of arbitrary. Uh, and then there's this weird one which looks like a singlet, except that, except that the two deals, alpha, beta, beta, alpha, uh, they're added together, whereas here they were, they were subtracted. So that's how they're different. So um, I could have prepared the excited state, these other types of triplets, had I used the right polarization of light and magnetic fields. There's all kinds of crazy tricks you can do to excite our H minus into whatever state we want. So we've been doing that for about 50 years. Okay, so still just reviewing, because I know it is bombastically awful, especially when we got to here. <laughs> and, okay, why is the triplet lower in energy? Well, we have to do the Hamiltonian. I mentioned that we, you have to do this now with expectation values. You cannot use the eigenvalue equation because of the um, Coulomb operator means that those wave functions don't work in the eigenvalue way. They won't come back times the eigenvalue anymore. And when you run into that situation, remember, you're not dead. You just use expectation value. Problem is more complicated. Cool that it works, but it's <laughs> way more complicated to do. And so, the wave functions have like two or four terms, uh, depending on seeing the triplet. Hamiltonian has five terms. Remember that uh, I have an integral sign for the first electron and an integral sign for the second electron, but really those are three for each one, so it's a total of six integrals. I just don't want to write six integrals because that sucks. And <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's really a mouthful, isn't it? The end result is that you're going to have kinetic energy, coulombic energy, and what I did not express last time, I just said coulombic energy, and then later on I showed you that there's this weird one. Okay, so, so I didn't quite do this the same way last time. Uh, now obviously, what else can there be? Kinetic energy is easy to understand. As much as the kinetic energy operator, the thing that we spent most of our time on quantum mechanics working on 
it's still kinetic energy. Not, I don't think that's terribly difficult to understand. P squared over 2m and all that. The Coulomb operator starts out being kind of easy. There is the first electron's interaction with the nucleus. So there's Coulomb's law. And you end up with wave function, complex conjugate operator, wave function. But you can multiply those across. And so what you can see is, is that it's energetically downhill. There's a minus sign. This is the probability density of where is the electron. And then this tells you how much energy it has interacting with the nucleus. So, you know, hopefully this is very simple to understand. Technically, you're still integrating over theta and phi and all that. It details. Okay, the second electron also interacts with the nucleus. The And again, this tells you where it is, and this tells you what the energy is based on where the electron is. You know, I, I'd hope that this would not be mind-blowing at this point. It's also energetically downhill. And then you end up with um, the third term, which again, I think is quite sensible. These are the two electrons interacting with each other, uh, which is bad, right? Uh, energetically downhill, good, but the two, inter uh, two electrons interacting with each other is uphill. They, they, it, electrons don't want to interact with each other, right? So here is where the first electron is, here's where the second electron is, and there's the distance in between, again, Coulomb's law. So that drives you uphill. So all of this is perfectly sensible, except, except in the evaluation of this thing, out comes this due to the electron-electron interaction. And this is the exchange term. And it doesn't make sense. It starts out like, OK, wave function, uh, the, the first electron's in its orbital, complex conjugate. Second electron's in its orbital. I don't see anything weird. Here's the operator, all right. And then you get to whatever the heck this is. The second electron's in the first orbital, and the first electron's in the second orbital. What? <laughs> what? I don't know. I don't know. I have no way of explaining what this means or why. I know why it's there. It's just a bunch of algebra. But it's not zero. It is what it is. It is plus, plus for singlet and minus for triplet. And that is why I mentioned at the very beginning that in an excited state, you probably go to a singlet state. And it's higher in energy because it absorbed a photon. But if it can warm its way down, if the spin can flip to a triplet state, it's actually slightly lower in energy. So this is, it's a small, this is a small amount of energy. But it's not zero either. It is weird as heck. But it is why triplets are lower in energy. So I hoped that that um, gives you, again, I'm just summarizing the last lecture because it was really kind of a bear of a lecture. It's definitely one of the more complex lectures. So between watching that and watching this, I hope, again, you get a big picture of what was happening. Now today, as I, <laughs> uh, how long have I been talking? I have to keep track of time. <laughs> um, today, uh, there's a lot of little details we're going to cover. And I'm going to tell you about magnetism. I didn't quite get to it last time. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you how magnets work. And it has to do with exchange. And uh, so, so we're going to talk about a couple, a couple other little fine details and shielding and whatnot. I think I need to wipe out the board. So give me a few minutes, and then we're going to, we're going to go over a whole bunch of little details before we get into the next subject of uh, spectroscopy and, and why cell phones work, the part you care about. I promised you I would tell you about cell phones. Be right back. OK, we're back. And I couldn't help but cheat a little bit. I want to give a little bit of a better diagram about how we generalize what I was just talking about. As much as I was trying to put things in terms of H minus, which is as simple as I could ever make it, it's generalizable, this whole you know, singlet ground state. All, H minus, just about everything. It's kind of rare to have something that doesn't have electrons paired in its ground state, all electrons paired atoms, molecules, most things like to be singlet. So it's kind of guaranteed that things are in the singlet state. And you may recall some of this from uh, one, of the, one of the PCHEM labs, this little diagram. OK, along comes light. 
And because light does not have that type of angular momentum that is spin, it generally will stay, now we're in an excited state because we have absorbed light, but it's still going to be in a singlet state. And this is how we tend to designate this. For all the reasons I just mentioned, there, it is fairly true that a triplet is lower in energy. Now, I said it was absolutely true previously, but that was because I was talking about H minus, for which I know it to be absolutely true that the triplet is lower in energy. Now, when you're dealing with molecules, it's not necessarily so clear. To know for certain, you have to do complex computing. <laughs> Remember I talked about the supercomputer? How mathematicians have tried to figure out how to do quantum mechanics on um, um, with that whole correlation energy. Maybe you recall that. Mathematicians have figured out ways to do this as accurately as possible. And when they do that, the results can be complex to the point where it is not necessarily true that, an ex that, that you, know, you go to an excited singlet state that a triplet is necessarily lower in energy. It usually is, especially for organic molecules. But it isn't necessarily the case. And to know, we have to have supercomputers and, and all this super software that's very expensive. And this is why we make these things. This is why we have giant computers to do exactly these types of calculations. I can actually do it pen and paper on hydrogen, H minus, crazy, but it can be it can be done. But if we're talking about you know, methane or benzene or DNA, forget it. Computer has to be done on a computer. And it will, for organics, generally say that your lowest energy is a triplet. Okay, now why is that important? Let's say it's DNA. Well, let's look at O2. Now I'm going to do a little bit to show you how you start to create atomic orbit. Uh, sorry, molecular orbitals from atomic orbitals. So here is the two p states of oxygen. Oxygen has four uh, electrons in. Um, uh, let's see, you can have a total of six electrons in the p in the two p's. Right? There's three. There's a px, py, and pz, and each can hold two electrons as long as they're spin up and spin down. So. Oxygen's got four of these. And um, now here's, here's one oxygen, and here's the other oxygen of our O2. And it also has, um, in the 2p states, it's obviously got the same number of electrons. Now what happens is they will combine uh, with certain symmetries and such that they will make molecular orbitals that look like this. And I'm going to have you do a little bit of the mathematics to understand how this works out the way it does. And now, now that I know that I have one state here, two states here, and these are bonding, these are anti-bonding, and you've seen this stuff before. And again, I will show you at one point how to do this, but I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. Uh, now we've got to just start filling electrons. Each one has two. Uh, and I have a total of um, eight electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh-oh. Triplet. Oxygen is triplet. Okay, so that is, that's a hell of a thing, by the way. Obviously, oxygen is quite useful. But the fact that it's a triplet means that if it runs into another triplet, it's going to react with it really freaking fast. Because this is like being a, it's like a di radical, right? And you, you know radicals are super reactive. They have unpaired electrons. Well, this has two unpaired electrons. So triplets can be very reactive, especially with other triplets. Now, most things in the ground states are singlet. So oxygen isn't just reacting like crazy with everything which keeps the world from burning. <laughs> but if it does run into a triplet, it will react with it. Like DNA. If your DNA gets excited and slips into a triplet state, and there's oxygen around, you got less DNA, which could give you cancer. So that's why that one's important. And I, I, I mentioned this before, but that's, this is basically how things, uh, how things corrode you know, with oxygen, how they oxidize. Um, how they photo each other. Another word for the same thing. Okay, so there's that. Let me tell you another interesting thing. I told you I was going to talk about magnets. Okay, 
Why do magnets form? All right. Some metals, let's just restrict ourselves to metal. You know oxygen is actually magnetic. And you've all seen that picture. Um, maybe I'm showing it right now. I remember to do that. <laughs> that famous picture of a bar magnet and oxygen being captured in, in, inside of it. And that's because it's magnetic. And triplets are naturally magnetic because they have unpaired electrons. Okay, not everything is magnetic. Uh, coins, right? So that's copper, right? That's not magnetic, so not as fun. Iron is magnetic, obviously. Cobalt. Cobalt's actually very magnetic. The problem is it oxidizes really quick, so that's why, you, you know, magnets that you play with as a kid, that's why they're made of um, iron. Okay, why is it some metals are magnetic and some are not? Now, it has to do with the exchange energy. If the exchange energy is high, it favors triplet states. So what makes exchange energy high or not for iron and cobalt and not so much with the others? All right, it kind of works like this. Now we're going to think of a metal as a whole bunch of atoms that are, you know, they're like this. And I can't really do a good job drawing a bunch of these, but I think you, you get the idea. You get um, a bunch of atoms in the solid state, and they're all hexagonal, close packed, or I don't know. OK, here's the deal. If the atoms are close, it turns out that um, the, the exchange part of energy is bigger if atoms are close together. So things like iron and cobalt have unpaired electrons. And it turns out if they're close together, then those unpaired electrons want to stay up, up, up like that, and look at that. Now I've got a whole bunch of electrons. Everyone's got an electron spin up. And they're all magnetic, and they're all adding to each other's magnetism. Right. Now this is called ferro, ferromagnetism, which is just magnetism. <laughs> OK, that's all it is. Because the atoms are close together, the exchange interaction is strong between the atoms. And that means their unpaired electrons want to stay aligned, as though they're like triplet, but to the nth degree. Super magnetism. That's, that's what you get out of that. Just, well, just magnetism. I don't know what super magnetism is. OK. Now let's look at, um, let's look at an anti-ferromagnet. And I'm going to draw this bigger. I think there could be like symmetry things that cause this to happen. So I'm just kind of arbitrarily just making it bigger. So now the atoms are like further away from each other. In that case, the exchange interaction might be small, and that means that they all anti, so this is called anti ferro magnetism. Okay, now that's when the exchange is actually small. So what you're seeing here dominate is now you know that two, um, two bar magnets. Two bark magnets, they really don't like to be like this, do they? they they'd rather flip, you know, north, south, south, north. They'd rather be like this, but exchange is what keeps them pointed up. But here, there's not as much exchange energy. And north, north, south, south, no, 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 they don't like that. So they're going to do this. Now, notice that I can cause every other one to unpair. And so every other, uh, every other one is is you know up down north to south south to north while the magnets like that look what it means for the whole thing it means that the magnetism never builds up this one basically cancels that one that cancels that one that cancels that one so this is not going to be magnetic so so there you go magnets right <laughs> i like magnets okay what else have we got okay last but again i know just a whole bunch of details um, let me say a little bit more about, uh, about why this works other than this corny picture. And that has to do with the fact that you know, what, why triplets can be lower in energy versus singlet states. Now, you may recall that the singlet has, um, I have to write it out again. Uh, it has this 
space part like this. And that means that there's constructive interference between, let, let, me, let me like think about two atoms that are right next to each other. And what that, what would, what would happen, sorry, I meant to put it like that. So this is like a singlet state. What that means is, uh, because these add together, it means that if you look at the electron density, it's going to go more like that. And this ends up actually kind of being higher in energy um, because the electrons are kind of bunched up next to each other, right? So, so you know, you know that an electron belongs here and another electron belongs there, but they kind of get close together. Now, that will make more sense. Let me let me draw a triplet, right? So, and that one is the same deal as the singlet, except there's a minus sign. And what does that do? It means that that same picture more, accurate, uh, more accurately looks like this. Sorry, I'm kind of out of room. I should have thought ahead. Kind of looks more like that. Now, what that means is, and of course that's, that's like a node, right? What that means is that these electrons are actually kind of staying away from each other. Because that minus sign creates like a node right there. That means the electrons tend to stay away from each other a little bit. And because of that, you know, that the, those electrons interacting with each other is, is bad. I hate to use that description, but that works, right? The electrons interacting with each other is bad, so if they stay away from each other because of that minus sign which does that, then that's good. So that's why you get a little bit of a lower energy. Okay, one more, sub two, oh, sorry, two more subjects to mop up. And I see I have plenty of time. Um, so I, this, today's lecture is just a whole bunch of like little details, probably on the test. Um, so this is one of the times, this lecture, so, you know, I hate to ask memorization questions, but whatever makes it to the test from this lecture is gonna be like that. So just, you know, at least I'm telling you, right? Let me wipe out the board, and we're going to come. Uh, we're going to go over two other just subjects that are pretty important, but you know, it's just kind of like mopping up a bunch of details. So let me let me just wipe out the board. I'll be right back. Okay, so more mopping up. Next subject, next random subject in this random lecture: shielding. Okay, now what this is about is the configuration of multi-electronic elements. So in freshman, you learned about when you, when you go down the periodic table and you look at heavier and heavier elements, at one point maybe you even had to memorize like what was the electronic configuration of various elements. And there were some like rules to that and you probably had to memorize them, which is, you know, I don't like doing that, but sometimes, you know, what exactly is a class that if it doesn't have some element of that, and so that's what we're going to talk about now. I also want to remind you, I'm sure I'm flashing up a periodic table, like one that you can actually read, than whatever I've drawn here. I have, to, I have to have something to interact with, right? So there's a reason that we have S, D, P, and really the F. The F is in between S and D, but it, it just would never fit on a piece of paper. So you have this like little line that goes between S and D. And you notice that before, right? You, you, you realize that that's because F the F block actually comes in between S and D, and it just doesn't fit, so that's why we have the F block. You know, the uranium and all that jazz, polonium, plutonium, is all, is all written down here, but it's really between S and D. So why, why does the periodic table, if you get to heavy elements, go S, F, D, P? Why does it do that? And it has to do with shielding. Now I'm going to remind you, you've seen this, you had to have seen this, there isn't a high school in a freshman chemistry class that doesn't cover this, but let me remind you that a hydrogen atom, the energy depends on the n quantum number, and that's one, two, on and on and on. It does not depend on L. That means that the S and P are degenerate. Now, that was all solved for a hydrogen atom with one electron. When you have two electrons, anything goes. To say that this is still true, any of it is still true, is an approximation. 
to even say that we even have S and P states is an approximation. Now, our supercomputers have told us it's quite good until you actually get to re really heavy elements, and then it actually breaks down a little bit. And I'll tell you a little bit about that at the end of the lecture. But regardless, if the hydrogen atom is true only for a hydrogen atom, which is true, then some of this picture can get kind of messed up once we're talking about multi-electron atoms. And here's one way that here's one thing that happens. Okay, here is when you add an extra electron. Okay, so the 1s will still be the lowest energy. You're not going to mess with that. But what can happen is the 2s is here and the 2p's. So there's a splitting between the 2s and the 2p. The 2p is slightly higher in energy, or maybe you want to say the 2s. It's like 2p is slightly higher in energy, or the 2s is slightly lower in energy, or both are happening. I don't really know how to put it in all honesty. It would do the same thing. Um, so when you have multi-electron atoms, because the hydrogen atom is only true of the hydrogen atom, the supercomputers tell us, and, and we know from other experimental this and that, that there's actually um, a splitting of energy levels between the S and P states. We'll talk about uh, n equals 3 and 4 in a minute. But now, why is this happening? And it turns out that, and I'm sure this is going to be a what's wrong or explain in words question, let's look at the hydrogen atom wave functions. And recall, I can't repeat this enough, so you know this is going to be a test question. These wave functions are only true of hydrogen, which only by definition has one electron. But it's a good starting point. Now, I know that a 2s looks like this. It has a node, and it goes up like that. OK, on the same scale, hopefully I'm doing this roughly correct. Um, yeah, I didn't quite do that right. Uh, here's the 2p. So that's 2s. Here's the 2p. OK. Now, the thing about this is, each one of these, instead of just being the result of some calculation of what the of what the electron's wave function, what the single electron's wave function is in a hydrogen atom, which only has one electron, so it's like an either-or situation for the electron. If you have two electrons, then both these states can now be simultaneously occupied. That's not something we considered possible with the hydrogen atom because it only has one electron. Okay, now that we have two electrons, guess what? If both these states are occupied, you see, whichever one is in the 2s is more likely to be found closer to the nucleus. Now, you're going to do a homework problem on this, and you're going to show that this is true. The 2s electron is more likely to be right up next to the nucleus than the 2p. And it, hopefully it just is kind of obvious from this graph, right? Okay, now, as a result, the 2s shields, shields the 2p. What that means is that the 2p doesn't see the nucleus as being as positive as it really is. It effectively sees, a le it effectively sees less nuclear charge. Now, remember that the, both these guys, but so in the case of the 2p, its interaction with the nucleus is down energy hill, right? That's a good Coulombic interaction. That's a negative energy. That's good. It's downhill. And it depends on what the charge of the nucleus is. But this damn thing is getting in the way. It's getting in the way, and so this electron sees less positive charge. And so that's going to rise its energy up. So that's what causes a splitting. Now we can play this game further with, with other, um, other states. So I'll tell you what, let me, let me give the results and let, let me, I'll draw one other wave function. So uh, I won't uh, go into this much detail. This is generally what you find. Again, 1s will be the lowest energy because it's not that crazy. 2s, now I've already drawn this part, so 2p. Next, of course, now, now there's nothing else 
to come after that except the 3s so that's more that's like normal right so we're like right here on the periodic table if I'm not mistaken and um, next comes 3p right so there's that same type of splitting and now this is where we're going to have another like nutty thing happen now we've got 4s and now here's our 3d so actually what, yeah, what was i saying this is so this is like one two three so this is like i hope i'm doing this right now i'm gonna have to like refilm all this so these are like 4s and then these are 3d right something like that <laughs> I, if I'm wrong about this, I'm going to kick myself because I have to refill all this. Um, so again, you're seeing why the periodic table is laid out the way it is. So it's kind of the same deal. The 4s electron is closer to the nucleus than the 3d. So even though 4s is ostensibly very, it is way above the 3d in a hydrogen atom, when I am adding electrons and electrons and electrons, so I'm like describing some pretty heavy elements. I'm like describing like, like iron and cobalt now, which has tons of electrons compared to hydrogen. Then all these states are filled. And if I'm filling up 4s states, then those are closer to the nucleus than the 3d, even though the n quantum number is one higher, which normally is like, means it's way higher in energy. But it's so much closer to the nucleus, and that's good, good for it, it's bad for the 3d. Uh, then you've got the 4p has to show up at some point. Here we are. And then now, now we're out of state, so now we have to go to 5s. And on and on and on. Now we're like getting up to like, like uranium and all that stuff, so I won't, don't need to go further. Another thing is, is that this is generally what you see, but even this can get violated. Now, I know that's kind of unsatisfying. It's because what I'm presented here, it's like a general, you know, th this is just a bunch of drawings, right? To know how these things are ordered, it, it actually is element to element specific. There's some like a couple of elements, ions especially, that will completely blow even this trend. You know, this is a non-hydrogenic trend. Uh, so the hydrogen orbitals are, are messed up, but even this can get messed up with specific atoms. And the reason is, is because it it's really gets complicated. All this stuff gets complicated. And seriously, you need supercomputers to, to actually work this out for us. So, as I've actually I've alluded to this a couple of times, in your undergraduate education, you know, this is it. Why is this it? Because if you want to go further in this particular field, you seriously have to start learning how to program supercomputers. That's what you would do in grad school. Now, as much as you're like, oh, well, screw that. But you get to program supercomputers. Seriously, when new students join, they're given access to our supercomputer. And they can log in and start doing these calculations at will uh, because it's a resource available to them. And as you can see, it's technically the next step. It's the next step in your education. So, um, so I, you know, I don't mean to be unsatisfying. This is how, so this is shielding. This is how it works. This is generally the trend you see. But there are crazy exceptions because of all that wave function, this Hamiltonian that, that you just saw a little while ago. OK, one last subject. And I see, uh, maybe we'll, I have no idea what time it is. Maybe we'll get early, early, maybe we won't. Uh, and this is called spin, spin orbit coupling. Okay, now, <laughs> I'm kind of jumping around like a squirrel. Um, this is actually why, remember how uh, DNA absorbs light. It's in the singlet state, excited state singlet, goes off to the triplet state. Why does it go into the triplet state? Well, it's lower in energy, sure. But still, um, that, that's not enough because there has to be some kind of angular momentum thing happening, right? Um, downhill in energy doesn't conserve, you know, just because you go downhill in energy doesn't conserve angular momentum. Okay, so spin orbit coupling is why, what, why am I describing that here, right? Um, here's the excited state, and then you can um, go to the triplet state. Okay, 
Now, now, why is this? It's because it's been orbit coupling. Now, this is due to the theory of relativity. And I've got equations out the wazoo, but I think I'll spare you. Uh, what, what I'm kind of fascinated about is that people often say uh, that the theory of relativity and quantum mechanics are separated and that physicists are looking for ways to combine them. That's not really true. Quantum mechanics can actually be derived from the theory of relativity. So they're really not that separated. If you incorporate ideas of the theory of relativity into the Schrodinger equation, one of the things that pop out is spin orbit coupling. And spin orbit coupling is very much a real thing. So what it is, it's, it's actually really simple to understand. Let's talk about things that are rotating. That means L equals 1, 2, 3 on the number line. So PDS states, not S states. Now, I have to be talking about things rotating. So there's our nucleus, and here's our electron, and the electron is whizzing around. Okay. I don't know if that's the most accurate representation, but regardless, think about how power generators work, or slot cars. Remember the little thing, you have a trigger, and the little car goes around a track. It's actually really boring. All of that works. Electric motors, and a power generator is really an electric motor working in reverse. All of this happens because a moving electron creates a magnetic field, or a moving magnetic field creates an electron. That's how generators work. Okay, so this electron is whizzing around, if it is whizzing around, meaning this has to be a P or a D or an F state. And if so, that means that there's a magnetic field. Right? And I remember, oh, I hate this stuff. It's a curl, right hand rule, all that stuff. So, anyway. So the electrons whizzing around, the magnetic field is going to look like this, it's going to look like a toroid. I hope, I hope I've done that correctly, I'm not entirely sure. And, and on this side, it's like that. Okay. So, again, this is actually not too hard to understand. An electron moving is, you know, accelerating as it goes around the track, that, that technically is accelerating, will create a magnetic field. It, by virtue of its own motion, its own angular momentum, its own angular rotation, it's creating a magnetic field. Okay, but the problem is, is that this guy is spinning too, kind of, right? Spin angular momentum. The angular momentum, we don't, we're not really sure what it is, but it behaves as though it's rotating. What did I just say about a rotating charge? It has a magnetic field. I have two magnetic fields. The magnetic field the electron generates by rotating, and the magnetic field that it has by virtue of existing. Uh, it can be alpha, so the magnetic field is pointed up, or it can be beta, and the magnetic field is pointed down. Okay, so what does that mean energetically? I'm going to redraw this, except less crazily. Okay, so let's think about Okay, so here we are rotating again. Now this is the L type of angular momentum. This is, the electron is the moon and the nucleus is the earth, right? So this is the one you understand. And remember that angular, angular momentum is like the axle of a wheel. So I'll draw that vector pointed up. And that is L, All right? Okay, now the electron itself can be rotating via S. Okay, so let's say that the uh, rotations are aligned like that. Now, technically, that's bad. Now, the reason is that that would be energetically raising. Now, why is that? That is like two bar magnets with north to north, south to south. That's bad, right? You, you know, you, when you're a kid, you try to force them together, you still do it. <laughs> so whenever I find a, you know, whenever I see a pair of magnets, I have to play with them. Okay, so this interaction would be bad. This is spin orbit coupling. This is, this is technically what spin orbit coupling is. And this would be bad versus, let me do that again. So there's our L angular momentum. I'll draw that the same way, 
but this time I will draw the spin going the other way. So there's the so here's the L and here's the S. Okay, here I've still got north south on the L type of magnetism, but I've got south north 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 south south north on the S type of magnetism. Okay, now that's good. North to south, south to north. So this is energetically lower. Sorry everyone, camera power ran out, so I wiped out the board and cleaned up things a bit. Okay, so we were talking about how to deal with spin orbit coupling, and what I've done is I've written the multi-electron Hamiltonian, and notice that what I've done here, I've done something a little different, I've gotten rid of all the constants, and that's because on your homework you've learned that there's a system of units that there are no constants. The 1 over 4 pi E naught in Coulomb's law is just 1, E squared, E is 1, the charge of an electron is 1, so E squared is 1, uh, H bar is 1, the mass of an electron is 1. So you can see it's, it's kind of cool when you, if you ever actually work with this like I do for a living, it's pretty awesome if all the constants are gone and the energy is in hard trees. That, that's the only consequence is that the energy you calculate is in units of what's called a hard tree, and half a hard tree is the energy of a hydrogen atom. So, details. It doesn't matter. Uh, it's on your homework. Okay, the way to deal with spin orbit coupling, that magnetic north south deal, is that there's an extra term on the Hamiltonian. And there's some stuff, who cares? But what it comes down to is that you have angular momentum, the, the L type angular momentum. So, I'm like, this is like a P or a D state, right? And S being the spin, spin up, spin down. So, it's a dot product. Okay, so whatever. That's not so important, but what is important is the implication. Now, we're used to, at this point, you, you've seen this many, many times now. Hopefully, you're kind of sick of this. You've got yourself, let's do a, you know, we have a radial, we have an angular uh, wave function multiplied, and then we're going to take, you know, alpha, beta. So this looks like a singlet. Minus beta alpha, beta alpha, sorry. So it looks like I've written out a singlet wave function. So I've got a radial, uh, an angular part, a rotational part, and a spin part. If you have a term with the angular and spin part in, this, in the same term, and you can't separate it, then you can't write wave functions out this way, right? I can't have an angular and a spin part as two separate functions multiply. Okay, what's the answer? Yeah, we don't know. There is no answer. There's no way to solve this. We, I mean, we don't even know what these functions are. <laughs> okay, so that's the implication. Now, it turns out that mathematically, there's a way to to deal with this as best as, as you can, there's no solution. There's, a, there's an approximation to like kind of fix it. And this might be, this, you may hear this in other contexts. This is a well-known mathematical te technique. Uh, called perturbation theory. And what this means is, is that if the the part of the function that you really, that kind of messes thing up, messes everything up. If it's, if it's a little on the smaller side, but important, here's what you do. Yeah, and, and I'll be specific for the case of, of, this, of this spin thing. The idea is that, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this singlet state that I've written up here, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna say it's 99 I mean, this, this is a parameter that is changed to help um, do the, to, to give the best description possible. So what you say is 99% the singlet function like, like written here, and then you assume that there's maybe a 1% of a triplet state. And what you would do is you would change, now again, I've just written this 99 and 1%, that's just arbitrary, but it's about right. It's, it's about, um, you would say that your, what you normally call a single state is mostly a, a single state, but there's a little bit of triplet mixed in. And at that point, as I've said a couple times, you're having to use a supercomputer and all that jazz, 
and the supercomputer figures out what are the best coefficients, but it would mostly be singlet and a little bit of triplet. And that's if the spin orbit coupling term is like small energy, which it usually is for light elements. And to draw this pictorially, now I've used the term eigenvectors many, many times for eigenfunctions. Remember, there's three terms. Wave functions, I usually reserve, so, reserve those for the Hamiltonian. Eigenfunctions and eigenvectors, and they're all the same thing, actually. Now here's why I call this an eigenvector. Here's how we think of spin orbit coupling, is that the state, uh, so the state in the, that, that's like nominally singlet, and here is the triplet direction, um, what's happening is spin orbit coupling kind of bends the state to the triplet. And so what it ends up happening, so this is the real state. So what ends up happening is th there's a component that's triplet. So it, it bends into the triplet direction. So we can think of these wave functions as like vectors pointing along either pure singlet or pure triplet. In reality, is due to spin orbit coupling, there's an admixture in between. Now, no, I'm almost out of time, so let me just point out what happens as a result of this. Uh, now, one thing is this is a mathematical technique that's used for a bunch of things, so you may see this in other things. Uh, regardless, and I, I've got to finish up because I think I've, I've gone over. Okay, so we know that if we have uh, our H minus or really anything, and most things, DNA, whatever, is in the singlet state, and we absorb light, to an excited state, we're probably going to be still in the singlet, uh, excited singlet state because light doesn't have S-type angular momentum. Okay, that's all fine and good, but like we had explored earlier with the H minus, a triplet, a triplet excited state is lower in energy, and that was because of the exchange and all that. But how does it, how does that spin flip? How do we go from like spin up and then spin down in an excited state to spin up, spin up both, you know, one in the ground state, one in the excited state? How does that spin flip occur? It occurs because of this. It occurs because of spin orbit coupling. It, it occurs because this state is not really 100% triplet. So it's like it opens a door. It's a narrow door, so most things will stay here, but every now and then a molecule will completely flip over to the to the triplet state. Now, in that case, it would be 99% triplet, maybe still 1% singlet, but it's still mostly triplet. And when that happens, then it can do things like react with oxygen, which will destroy it. And if it's your DNA, you get cancer, and you've heard me say that a couple of times. So, okay, uh, regardless. Um, and then there's one other detail. Don't worry about memorizing this, but the spin orbit coupling, so let's say SO, spin orbit coupling energy, uh, it actually scales as the mass to the fourth power. That, that's the atomic mass. And what that means is that for most of like organic chemistry, the top of the periodic table, spin orbit coupling is, is really, really small effect. So that's why I wrote these like kind of small numbers up here. But if you get to things like gold, um, uranium, and plutonium, then it's so big that you now have to think of that as like the most important part of the Hamiltonian. So you can't actually try to analyze it with perturbation theory anymore. And, and if that's the case, you actually have to really, then your supercomputer programming skills have to be like really, really good because that's what it takes. Anyway, uh, that's enough for today. I think I've gone a little over, sorry about that. Um, what I'll do is I'll make up for it next lecture. Next lecture is going to be where I'm going to tell you about cell phones and microwave ovens and radio towers. So that'll be kind of fun. It'll be kind of easy. So we'll have a little bit of a break. It'll be very descriptive. So I hope you like that. Okay. All right. I'll see you then.